Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Path to Self Sovereignty podcast. Today, we are with Matt Presty. Matt is a meta scientist, musician, philosopher, poet, and current president of the University of Science and Philosophy, formerly known as the Walter Russell Foundation. Uh, Matt, thanks a lot for coming on. I, uh, thanks for. No, no problem. I first uh, come across your work um, back in 2017. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was on the Unslaved podcast, I think, with uh, David Whitehead and Michael Tazarian, um, mm-hmm. two people who've had quite a big, profound impact on my life, to be fair. Can you, yeah. can you tell me a bit about your history and like, how you've got to where you've got to? Well, I, uh, I was always interested in learning more about esoteric subjects from an earlier age. Um, as a kid, um, it was UFOs and Bigfoot and Loch Ness, you know. So as I got older, you know, like we all do, we kind of go off on a different path away from studying, away from researching into more of the worldly existence. Um, around my 30s, I got more, I, I should say, I, I shot myself in the foot enough times that I hit a bottom point in my life where the only place to go from there was up. And that's about the same time as 9-11 happened. So there was sort of a a major awakening in myself that would lead me eventually to become president of the University of Science and Philosophy. Um, You know, that that was an interesting uh, adventure there. I never thought in a million years that I would would ever be so, um, as I don't even have a formal college education. But um, ultimately, things would... uh, move from the study of conspiracy into more of the study of, uh, again, esoteric subjects throughout my 30s, um, the great mystery, illumination, and finally discovering Walter Russell in 2008, which led me to uh, get noticed by the then current president, Michael Hudak, who picked me as his replacement in uh, 2014. And uh, here I am today. And I must just state that um, my personal opinions are not necessarily those of the University of Science and Philosophy, nor the two volunteer fire departments I, I, I work for. But uh, nonetheless, everybody's entitled to their opinion and to see things the way that they do. So I'm happy to join you, Alex. Thanks. Oh, it's great to have you on, mate, really is. Um, could you, for anyone listening who doesn't know who Walter Russell is, could you just give a, a bit of a background to the to the, the great guy? He was a profound illuminate. He, uh, He mastered all the five fine arts with only a fourth grade education. He was conferred 11 degrees, a doctorate of science as well, without a college education. He was a prominent artist, uh, an author, philosopher, and him and his wife, Leo Russell, had started the University of Science and Philosophy uh, December 2nd, 1948, and it's over 71 years old, still in existence today, and they based their... their, uh, institution on the advice of uh, Alexis Carroll, who said that man has all these wonderful sciences, but he has no science of his soul. And unless man knows what his soul is and his relationship to it, we're always going to be at a deficit and and end up as cogs in the machine of industry, soulless cogs in the machine of industry. So by his advice, the Russells followed that along. And and of course, Herbert Spencer, the founder of the Twilight Club back in the 1870s, a British philosopher, um, wonderful author um, of such works as The Man Versus the State and other things. Uh, He formed the Twilight Club with the illuminaries of the day, Walt Whitman, Mark Twain, Edwin Markham, who said, in vain, we build the city if we do not first build the man. And the impetus was the focus on character. And again, uh, helping man to survive transitioning into the Industrial Revolution, which all these prominent artists saw, poets, artists, and such, saw as a slippery slope that man would just simply become, again, a cog in the machine of industry, lose his soul in the process, which would lead inevitably to a, to a um, collapse of civilization. If you take the heart out of civilization, and you only have gears in its place, then you walk a slippery slope. And and I think that's where really, if you look around today, one would have to admit that's the that's the place we're at. Because psychologically, there's there's many self-murdered people forming the groups of the political and militant wings of 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 
one party in particular I could mention in the United States here, but we're seeing this play out, you know, kind of the soulless, um, emotionally driven, uncentered um, effort to basically tear down civilization. And it's, you know, again, it's a communistic push, but uh, communism, as the Russells would say, is filled with the discontented, the ranks of communism. And nothing could be further, you know, nothing could be closer to the truth, I would say, if one looks around at the state of the world today. So the, the, Walt, the Walter Russell that most people know as a scientist, a uh, friend of Nikola Tesla, was also very vocal about, you know, the state of mankind's mind. And again, their school, the University of Science of Philosophy, was founded to address the soul of man and to teach the science of the soul, the science of man himself to men so that we could stave off the collapse of civilization, which uh, their predecessor in the Twilight Club saw as an inevitability if we didn't change direction. You mentioned the science of the soul a few times there. How different is, is, is Russell's philosophy to like hermeticism or you know, like ancient mysticism? Well, it's very similar in a lot of ways. Um, I like to call it a three-dimensional alchemy. He took uh, the square and the circle and transmuted it into the cube and the sphere from a scientific angle. Um, it's similar to the animus and anima of Carl Jung, where you know you, you have to get that balance between the hemispheres, between the feminine and the masculine. Um, they called it fulcrum, fulcrum thinking, or the location of the creator is the fulcrum of man, that point between the hemispheres of the body. Um, likened it to many different great writings by Illuminates, Lao Tzu, um, Jesus, uh, Buddha, and of course many of the great poets, authors, and uh, Emerson, um, Dante, you, you go on and on. They, they cited many people's works as far as uh, a psychological angle. And, and I really must say that psychology and spirituality are uh, very synonymous. <laughs> I mean, one, one really is the other in just practical terms. It's not, it's not so mysterious as, as we might think. But I, I haven't really met any spiritual people that aren't first psychologically adept, you know, having dealt with their own inner turmoils and things like that. You can't really come to a, a, a balanced position in your life if you don't have first the marriage of the opposites, which are, are light and shadow matter and spirit, you know, all these different opposites. But again, uh, I think the, uh, the hermetic teachings are such that they focus on balance quite a lot. The Russell teachings, uh, Lao Tzu, you know, and other great illuminates, authors, mystics, poets of the time, going back, you know, into the thousands of years have all expressed this similar idea. It's, a, it's sort of a golden thread that runs through the teachings of all uh, mystics. Mm. So you mentioned the fulcrum there, like, uh, uh, if you like, the stillness and the center point. I mm -hmm. always had the, because it's a bit, to me, it's a bit of a new age myth where they talk about, like, um, you know, raise your vibration as high as possible. And, and it, that never made sense to me when I heard that, because there was something within me that saying, well, every time I go to meditate, for example, I, I, I purposely go out my way to become still. So why on earth would I want to vibrate as high as possible? I'm using that metaphorically. Uh, if, if I seem to be doing the complete opposite whenever I feel in tune with God, for the lack of a better term. So what does Walter Russell say about that? Is it actually low in the vibration or higher in the vibration? Well, the, the whole idea of the God is a very high, extremely high vibration comes from the Kabbalion, which was written by the three initiates, some some, some would say three Masons basically wrote that back in the late uh, 18th century. Yeah. Um, the Russells would say, and this is their direct quote, there are absolutely no vibrations to the spirit whatsoever. So that was when I read that and I, and I was, I had this, you know, cognitive dissonance going on because I'm like, well, we can't be on one hand, everybody saying you got to raise your vibration to get to, you know, and this comes from, again, the idea of, of uh, dimensions, higher dimensions, which is an Einsteinian uh, 
basically borrowed from Edwin Abbott, who wrote Flatlanders, who wrote of this dimension beyond the third. Well, Einstein basically stole Abbott's idea to create a science fiction called the fourth dimension to allow for his time to exist in his equation as a as a uh, presentable, you know, uh, I, uh, theory. So ultimately, what you want to do <laughs> is not raise your vibration because, again, a fever, or I could just point out some examples of a high vibration that's you could you can measure this with any calibrated instrument. Um, a thermometer measures a fever, which is a high vibration. It's a, it's a radioactive state of the human body. A earthquake is an extremely high vibration. And if you want to see the damages that an earthquake can do, just type in earthquake videos and, and you'll see a high vibration and what it's capable of. An explosion is a high vibration. So ultimately, this new age concept of raising your vibration comes from that um, idea of that you can get to the fifth, the love dimension, right? The fifth dimension. We're all going to go there if we just raise our vibration. And the more you stop and think about how ludicrous and asinine that whole concept is, there is no fifth dimension. And if there was, I wouldn't want to go there with the people that want to go there because they haven't done the work yeah, yeah. to live in the third dimension that's required to even think about getting to a place like Which that. Which is why they're trying to escape. Exactly. It's escapism, again, and, and, and no true spiritual discipline, you know, without psychological marriage of the opposites, the shadow and the light of oneself, you know, the hero and the villain, whatever you want to call it, uh, you can't get there without doing that psychological work, which is, in, a, in all intents and purposes, spiritual work. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, um, the whole concept of raising your vibrations uh, borrowed from Einstein and applied to the New Age movement, uh, I think was the desire to escape to a dimension beyond our own, which only higher vibrational things can enter into because of what the Kabbalion had said, because, you know, they, that writing basically. And the only thing I think that, that writing really, um, the Kabbalion got wrong was that idea that yeah, God yeah. is a very high vibration. Um, the Russells basically straightened that out for me, and, and that's why I did that, knowing the Creator yes. uh, 101. Uh, second episode was quite a lot about that, you know, mm -hmm. the, the misconception of raising your vibration. But most illuminates, most mystics, um, and you can read many quotes by them. Just type in quotes on stillness, and you'll read thousands of quotes about God being in the stillness. Be still and know. Mm -hmm. So if it was Einstein who sort of uh, used that, um, that work, what, because a lot of, correct me if I'm wrong here, Einstein's theories were uh, to do with like what we may now know as quantum theory. How does that differ from like Russell's work? Does he just outright deny it or? Well, Russell said the idea of a quantum was a travesty to nature, an absolute travesty to nature that, that nature doesn't, Energy doesn't come in packets, number one. I think salt packets, right? <laughs> but uh, um, packets of energy, yeah. Um, basically, the Russell science is, its presentation of energy is, energy is spirit, and there's no vibrations to energy whatsoever. But when energy divides into a polarized condition, it sets up an interchange that has to cycle back and forth which creates electric current, which is the basis for the electric universe model. And in Russell science, unlike other electric universe models, they leave out polarity. They, they, don't, they generally don't talk about um, the fulcrum between the polarity. They might show you two different poles. They might show you um, conditions of electricity, but without that fulcrum being the center point, you know, think of a seesaw, right? That seesaw moves on what? It moves on a fulcrum, and the, and the fulcrum doesn't move. And Russell would say, that's how we find God. We must find what's not moving. It's not apparent to our senses. So because God is not a sensory object, we ignore it. You know, when you open your door, what's not moving? 
the door jam, right? Yeah. So your, your door moves on something that doesn't move. All things that move, move on something that does not move. And it would behoove us to pay attention to what's not moving. As the Russells would say, that's where you find the location of the creator. And man, once he stops looking in motion for the creator and recognizes the stillness, he'll know the location of the creator. And so the electric wave itself, any polarity, any electrical interchange is set up by a division of that omnipresent energy field. And I've said this many times in interviews, but if you type in inverted galaxies, uh, inverted galaxy picture, you'll see that the black of space is inverted to look white. And that's actually the location of the energy. All black galaxy stars are actually divisions in that white light that's omnipresent, omniscient, and um, um, omnipotent. So therein, it's a God selfie, basically. But that white light is in and through everything. We move on it. That's mm. how things move. And that's why Russell said quantum uh, packets of energy was, was not true to nature. It was a, it was a, uh, a fallacy, basically. But that energy does not exist in motion. Energy causes a division, and that division moves on that source of energy, which is at the fulcrum. Mm. So it's an interesting concept, but it's true to nature, and it's provable through experiment. It can be proven a hundred million ways. Um, you know, just, but yeah, it's, it's, um, it's an interesting thing that man should only notice motion and not the stillness which motion moves upon. But surely that's just because most men uh, just rely on the senses and that's beyond sense, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. So like you know, knowing. Go on, buddy. What, you know, what, what else is beyond our senses? Love, right? We use mm. these words like love, beauty, knowledge. Is knowledge in a library? No. Mm -hmm. Knowledge is in the mind that reads the words in the books of the library. Now you won't find knowledge in a library. So again, it's quantitative reductionism that limits man's scope of perception to being only a physical entity with movable parts and things that respond to our senses as opposed to knowing in our mind um, irregardless of sensory perception. You can know you love somebody, but there's no test you can take. There's no empirical reductive laboratory test that they can swab your tongue and go, yep, he's in love. It's purple here, you know. Mm. Ultimately, love is, a, love is a quality of the mind, just like beauty, stillness, silence. These are all qualities of the mind. And if you look at some note, notation or the words in a book, there's spaces between the words, just like there's spaces between the notes on a musical score. What a disaster music would be if there was no silence between the notes. So, was it Mozart, I think, who said something like that? Something like Mozart? Yeah. Yeah. Like, Not Beethoven. The music, yeah, yeah mu uh, that music mm. is in the silence or something like that. Right. That was Beethoven. Mm -hmm. um, so as a, as a human being breathes, would that be, and, and that point in the middle, where it's, you know, there's either an in-breath or an out-breath, that, that middle bit, would that be uh, another example of the fulcrum? Yeah, well, you, you basically, as, as Russell would say, we, we are centered and bounded. The creator centers and bounds all motion. And when I say creator, you could, you could use 25, 30, 50 words to describe it. Silence, stillness, points of reversal, centering, uh, fulcrum, um, God, oneness, um, you know, there's a, a hundred different words you could use. Equilibrium. Basically, in your breathing cycle, you'll know the bounding that the creator applies when you breathe in and you can't go past a certain point. You have to reverse direction and breathe out. And then you hit that wall again. That's the cube wave field boundary, as Russell would call it. That's why he used that term, cubic wave field boundary. Because the motions of man are limited. You, know, you can only throw a ball in the air so high before it, it has to reverse direction. Uh, you can only extend a lever to a certain degree where it has to reverse direction. So ultimately, God is the boundary point or the still magnetic light, as he called it. There's many things, terms, again, that can connote the creator. And uh, 
So through your breathing cycle, not only is the zero centering you through the entire breath, but it also bounds the motions. And, and that's where the reversals happen. So you're meeting God with every in-breath and meeting God with every out-breath. And then God centers the motion in between both of them. Wow. Beautiful stuff. Um, you mentioned earlier about like uh, the, the, the way society is at the moment. If I, if I consider breath to be like a, a cycle, so it's in, uh, out, in, out, a cycle, do you think mankind goes through those cycles as well as, a, as like an organic entity? Yeah, and, uh, you know, if you're re regarding the, uh, let's just say the burning of cities, 150-something cities on fire a couple yeah. weeks ago, mm -hmm. um, that's what I would call an unnatural cycle. And basically the wave of creation, which is what Walter taught, in the secret li in the wave of creation lies the secret of all creation, in the wave. And the wave is basically an expression. Let's take nature, for instance. Nature, again, you have a division of stillness into a polarity. Those polarities set up the electric interchange. And what nature does with that electricity is builds. She creates. And that creation is what we call creation. Mm. Um, she's very much focused on the life half of the wave. So nature could not build or construct bodies in motion if the impetus was the focus of the death half. The death half of the wave is the natural disintegration. A volcano, yes, it's a violent reaction, but it's not evil. It's simply nature returning a condition of abnormality to a, nor to a normal condition, a, contention, a, a condition of intense pressure back to a condition of rest. All nature, all matter seeks to die, seeks to rest. So ultimately, if nature in, in the wave of creation built only toward the cycle of death or the, the death half of the wave, I should say, mm. then nothing would even grow out of the ground. It would die before it started. So man, in much the same way, not taking his cues from nature, is creating an environment of death upon the surface of the earth by simply focusing his thoughts toward death. Death is destruction. And the, the way you know that death, that the focus of, say, burning cities and, and rioters and looters mm. is the death half of the wave, the result of, of the, the thinking, okay, the thoughts of these people is fire, destruction. Yeah. Yeah. Where, where do you see construction? Where do you see good in that? You know, and so there's your prime example for a death half of the wave manifesting because of the thoughts of people, you know, and, and fire is the ultimate consumer of bodies. Nothing consumes bodies faster. It will melt steel. It will, you know, you get the fire hot enough. It will definitely, you know, bring down anybody. It will, it will destroy anybody, consume it back to a state of inert gas, which rises back into space to, to re, to again, re, re, be reborn through the poles of the planet and manifest on the surface. So ultimately the Russells would say that man's focus on the life half of the wave generates, it creates, and like nature, he can build a balanced civilization if there's balance between the opposites, the male and female of the species in particular was what they taught. So let's just take the human home, for instance. If there's no balance in a human home and a husband, wife, or constantly fighting, then you're probably going to notice that being the neighbor. You're going to hear yelling, screaming. The kids are going to be running around doing all kinds of crazy stuff in the neighborhood. They're not going to be balanced. So you can't possibly extend balance beyond your home if you don't have it in your home. So that's, that's where they said the wave of creation for humanity starts is in the home of every human being. And if you have balance in your home, you can extend that balance to the neighborhood. If you have a balanced neighborhood, you can extend that balance to, let's say, the county, and then the county to the state, the state to the nation, the nation to the world. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, their, their curriculum, their philosophy was how to achieve that balance. But it always starts in the individual. And that's why Leo would say, to know yourself is the greatest gift one could ever receive. Because mm -hmm. to know yourself is to know God. 
Yeah, but I'm a big uh, individualist. Um, mm -hmm. So I completely agree. And I think there's been something in America in particular um, where they've took, they've put, it seems to me that there's been a, a nefarious agenda to actually break up the family unit in America. That's mm -hmm. what seems to have happened. I'm not so much here in the UK, but um, would you think that, that there is actually an agenda behind all that to, to destruct the family unit? Certainly. Uh, John Stormer wrote the book, uh, None Dare Call It Treason, back in 64. There's The Russells wrote about communism in 1952. Uh, Russell in his lecture series uh, said that in 1952 that the, the biggest criminals in the United States were in the government. And he knew, and so did many of the contemporaries of that day, that there is a criminal element. Um, it was well known, you know, back to the times of Woodrow Wilson and the creation of the Federal Reserve Bank and the, the murder of three prominent businessmen who opposed it, who were worth millions and millions. They just all happened to die on the Titanic. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, there, there's, a, there's just a lot of evidence that had been floating around. And, and again, there, there's the quote, those who know about the conspiracy dare, dare not speak above their breath about it. And I think that was Wilson who might have said that. But nonetheless, it's, it's gotten, you know, attraction of it has certainly uh, people have begun to notice more and more and especially with the COVID uh, 1984 um, psycho operation um, people are now face to face with the conspiracy and it's undeniable mm. um, and they're using basically the, the, the test run for BLM um, Antifa which are uh, militant arms of the DNC uh, was Occupy Wall Street. That was the test run. Right. And once they realized that they could mobilize a large portion of, of collegiate youth to uh, carry out protests and such, that was you know proof that they should sit down and, and revamp the approach to make it even more targeted. So you just look at the who fun, who gets funded. When you, when you donate to these groups, who does that money go to? And in many instances, it's the DNC. So the DNC is actually now the globalist party. And then you have the nationalist party. I wouldn't even call it Republican anymore. It's, you know, you had so many rhino Republicans leave the party. It's, it's more the party of nationalism and populism, which is a, a no-no to the new world order. They, they do not want any uh, parties that are pro-nationalist. And uh, so Trump has been the target of them since day one. Now, again, I, I, I put no faith 100% in any man. I'll go as high as 90, but I always leave 10% for error. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you never know. I just, you know, but the enemy of my enemy is my friend, as they say. And as long as he's, you know, shooting holes in their sails, he'll have my support as long as that continues. But Again, there's always scrutiny. I scrutinize and I also expect to see things followed through. I'd like to hear the sound of handcuffs. Yeah. You know, I've been waiting for that for three years. Where's that noise? Click, 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 yeah. and gavels and, and sentences, right? Aren't we all hoping for that? But ultimately, the, the conspiracy as yes, to destroy the family, it's, it's ages old. Uh, they know that that's the basic unit of creation, the basic unit structure. Like I was saying, if there's not balance in the home, then you're raising imbalance and creating imbalance in the community, in the neighborhoods, in the state, in the cities, in the nation. You know, so it's, 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 it's a multiplication. The more imbalance you can create by having a single parent home, by having um, people who don't know what to identify as, that's divide and conquer. Anything that divides man, what good is it, right? And, and basically, if you want to look at it, the Occupy Wall Street movement, their whole movement was supposed to be against crony capitalism. Now, look at the Antifa, the BLM, and all these crony capitalist organizations are the primary funders, movers, and shakers backing. So how can you have groups of people that are against crony capitalism but we'll take the money from them, we'll do what they want, we'll, you know, accept the backing. 
I thought you were supposed to be against crony capitalists. So how, how could you accept money from, uh, you know, all the different corporations that are, you know, backing this? It, it's yeah. the biggest, you know, basically we got to get ahead of this narrative. We, we used to be, I'd say there's a, a movement in the populist movement. People were, were enjoying being ahead. Mm. They really haven't dug in to learn how to fight yet. And I mean by that a mental uh, defense. And we need to go on the offense, you know, instead of this just always pointing out what happened yesterday or just happened. We, yeah, we write our posts, we write our dislike for what's going on, but we've got to get ahead of the curve. We've got to get ahead of them and be the writers of, you know, what tomorrow's news is as opposed to just writing about yesterday's news. So mm -hmm. ultimately, yeah, there is a concerted effort to continually divide and conquer uh, they're, they're targeting the family home because that's where the stability of all civilization starts. Mm -hmm. So if you target the root, you're not going to end up with civilization as a tree. You're going to end up with a stump. Yeah, yeah. I've just read uh, Dinesh D'Souza's new book, uh, The United States of Socialism. And you, yeah. a, you made a good point there. And he, uh, Dinesh D'Souza says, um, the difference between the far left and, and uh, anyone centre-right now is that uh, it doesn't matter how many facts you throw at people, the far left have a narrative, and that's something the centre right or right wing don't have. There's no narrative. All they have is, is fact. So they throw all these facts and things at, at people, but it doesn't grasp someone's mind because there's no story behind anything. Like the far left have, the far left have like, uh, you know, they try and destroy history by saying, you know, all these people were slave traders, and, they said, and, it, and it grips an emotional attachment to it. We, I say we are, you know, whatever, politically, the other side of the coin, they haven't got that story. They're just throwing statistics at people and people aren't buying that. And I think that's because they're mentally and spiritually bankrupt, a lot of people. They're, they're not psychologically prepared to look at their own shadow or anything like that, spiritually developed. They're not interested. And that's why communism, I mean, you can see it here now. It's like you have neighbours stitching on each other. The police don't need to do their job because the neighbours are doing it for them. It's, a, it's an absolute joke, but you can just see the steps that are coming in. And uh, in, 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 in the name of safety and security, they're trying to sound all virtuous, but they're actually enslaving themselves by their own virtuousness. And uh, you, can't have, you can't even say anything to them uh, because then you, you know, you're the racist or you're the fascist or you're this and you're that. And there's no logical debate to be had anymore. It's just, it's just, you know, everything's all up in the air. Yeah, and that's by design. I mean, it's ad hominem, post hoc, every yeah. kind of logical fallacy you can imagine appeals to uh, authority. You know, since when is uh, Gillette an authority on toxic masculinity? Yeah. Like I like to say, just shut up and make your razor blades. You know? <laughs> co co corporations have no business zero business telling human beings what is moral or what isn't a corporation is not even a human being mm. okay so why would anybody listen to what a corporation has to say you know much less above a nascar or any 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 other of these you know sporting teams you know the, it again it's it's that the term is virtue signaling but i, I think it's what's what's a better term we need to come up with new terms instead mm. of virtue signal um immorality signal mm. you know because that's really what it is they're signaling Im immorality yeah you know don't be moral don't be virtuous be unvirtuous you know and and you'll you'll get the support of the mega donors the mega corporations right mm. so ultimately it's 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 basically a war on common sense because again as we know, the ranks of these people are not filled with reasonable, logical, logically thinking, calm, rational human beings. They're filled with the ranks of discontented, miserable, unhappy, spiritually murdered, self-murdered human beings who find identity only with the crowds they run with. And those crowds are dangerous. They will kill people, as we've seen. They will, they will cause death. They will cause looting, burning, riots, destruction. It's an absolute 
full-on demonstration of the deaf half of the wave. It's as if they're only focused on exhalation. And then, then even more ironically is people wear these masks that lowers their oxygen intake and they're breathing in more of their own dead breath, which is even creating more of a disease state in society. This is, this is, this, I got to give it to them. The, 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 the people behind this, they're not idiots. They know what they're doing. They've had a hundred plus years of, of psychological uh, data to go over. They've manipulated populations going back thousands of years, the elite, and it's transferred. Their notes are transferred one after the other. They study the failures of the past so they don't make them in the same. But, but again, I think their undoing is the fact that simply because the, the sole focus is on destruction. It's on what's going to replace civilization after it's destroyed. If these people could actually sit down, the ones doing the destroying, the ones rioting, tearing statues down, if they could sit down for five minutes and look into the future and really understand what's about to replace what they're trying to tear down, it would be like a come to Jesus moment <laughs> where they'd realize that, that what is going to replace what they're tearing down will be not only their death, but the death of literally everybody they know. And I, I just don't think when you're in an emotional state, when you're in an unbalanced state, you can't reasonably look to the future and weigh the consequences of what you do in the now, in the present. And you certainly don't understand the past if you're tearing down statues, nor do you want to understand the past. And that's what the radicalization of the youth in these colleges has done for, you know, yeah. Charlotte Thompson Iserby wrote the book, you know, um, on, on education and uh, John Gatto and, and you have so many other people that have, have exposed that, you know, in the fifties, we went off the Latin, we went off of uh, teaching men the trivium and quadrivium. Uh, we turned away from teaching people how to think critically and instead now apply emotionalism as an argumentative form. That's why in many of these videos where you see demonstrators approaching people who are counter protesters, you'll see these people that are unbalanced screaming, screaming at the top of their lungs, yeah. spitting all over, almost in tears. Some of them are crying as they're arguing. That's not argument. That's lunacy. Yeah. And, and how can, you know, how can you argue with anyone like that? Argument is an art. You know, it's not, it's not just a destructive thing. It's supposed to have some form of constructive, you know, benefit at the end you know and i'm sure any anybody on a political right-leaning platform would be absolutely willing to sit down and talk point to point across a table with some of these folks but the problem is you can't win over and you can't shame people and you can't make people feel guilty when you talk rationally and talk reasonably when it comes to facts figures and and statistics and mm -hmm. points of view you know, and that doesn't work well for their side because it would mean that they actually have to uh, employ and utilize the benefits of what Western civilization brought to humankind, which was rational debate, as opposed to irrational, burn, burn it all down if they don't agree with you, you know. And yeah. as long as that violent concept of argument is their go-to, we're never going to have a, a reasonable discussion. And these times come. You know, the last great war could have been in what the Bhagavad Gita wrote about when, when Prince Arjuna, you know, he threw his bow down on the ground and said, I, I'm not going to fight. Those are my cousins over there and family members and friends I grew up with. We were only at political odds, you know, and I don't want to fight them. So he threw his bow down, got off his horse, and, and then that's when the, the vision came to him and Krishna appeared and said, there is no death, Prince. Let me show you behind the wheels of creation, the actual reality of that which you have not yet seen or come to know. There is no death. And ultimately, his, his grand illumination, he saw the immortality of all things, including the foes across the field. And ultimately, Krishna would say, now, Prince, get back on your horse and do your duty. Yeah. Meet what nature brought to your door head on. And he did. He got on his horse and he slaughtered the other side. <laughs> so but what do you think also, what, what would you perceive doing your duty you personally now what do you think that is is that is being the president of the of the um the the, the the university or is it actually standing up to this in general or what would you see it as personally well again like i said I, I don't speak for the university but 
my job first and foremost is to preserve the Russell legacy as it is. You know, I'm not here to change it, alter it, or you know, necessarily teach different uh, points of view about it or, or replace anything that's been done. I'm simply preserving it, much like any historian would preserve without editing. You know, the actual factual reality and truth of a man and woman's life who is is by their own right an extraordinary amount of work. I mean, I've, I've never seen two people do so much with uh, their lives in one lifetime. And so caring for that and preserving it is my number one mission as president of this university. Now on a personal level, you know, I think we, we do need to stand up uh, at some point, what is gonna be the, the line in the sand? You know, my line in the sand uh, was made probably a few years ago. You know, I refused to, to go along, I'd say at least 10 years ago, maybe 12, I refused to go along with the mind control program, endless wars, you know, the so-called new world order and the coming forced vaccinations and all that, you know, there's nobody's going to stick me. Nobody's going to force me to wear a mask. I'm just not doing it, you know, and I'm not saying people that aren't immunocompromised shouldn't wear them, but, you know, again, breathing your own dead breath, I know personally is not a good thing. And uh, even OSHA standards will back that up. You know, and uh, it's really up to each and their own to make that decision. But for myself, you know, all we can do is, is try to, again, I think we, we as in our political leanings, whichever way they tend to be, I, I'm, I, I lean politically toward freedom, freedom and the liberties that come with freedom. So whatever people need, if they want to blanket me into a group of other people that love freedom, then, you know, if that makes me a conservative or whatever, I, I don't generally tend to do labels. I'm just for freedom. I'm for liberty. And those who are opposed to it, they're, they're making themselves my enemy. I don't go out and look for enemies, but I'm also not going to be told what I can think, what I can say that I have to take some foreign substance into my body when, when I don't believe in rape and I don't believe in forced vaccinations or forced anything into a body. You know, that's a violation of everything that, that makes my heart beat. So ultimately, yeah, I've, I've made the decision a long time ago to, to stand against that kind of psychological manipulation. And it's well and fine as long as it's psychological, but when it starts to become physical, that's when I think you're going to see a hell of a lot more people stand up and say enough is enough, you know, and, and call it the silent majority, call it what you want. But typically people that love life, freedom, they don't go out and burn things down. Okay. If that was the case, then there would be nothing but smoldering ruins left in this United States. Every rural uh, county city would already be burned down and there'd be, we wouldn't even be communicating right now. Because not just, you know, cities burn, but communications centers, uh, everything. But there's a lot of people that, that want to keep that going, and for good reason. And so they go to work, they do what needs to be done, and they don't buy into political ideologies that resort to violence, uh, shame, guilt, and uh, attacks against otherwise normally uh, calm and collective people that that really want nothing to do with extreme ideology ideologies like that so ultimately you know i think this has a lot more to play out we're going to see a lot of things uh take place in the next few weeks um i know i'm looking at july 4th as an interesting date so yeah, i'm yeah. keeping my eyes on that a lot of numerology around that one but uh Ultimately, you know, what we can do, I think, is a, as a countermeasure is try to get ahead of the narrative, get ahead of their narrative so that they have to catch up to us, you know, as opposed to us just, oh, they did that yesterday. Oh, they did that today. And, and we're, we're sitting here dissecting their lead, but we should be leading and them trying to dissect us to catch up with us. So I'm thinking in that kind of realm, like, how do we get ahead of the narrative and then kind of drop some oil slicks? behind our, our little vehicle that make them kind of have to uh, follow our lead for a while. You I, know, and I, think, I think it'll take a huge psychological upgrade for people to actually see um, that 
your philosophy there of like basically the philosophy of freedom, which is what Rudolf Steiner wrote a book, didn't he, called that book, that people aren't psychologically ready from my experience of, of the, they don't want to be free. They might give you lip service, but the last thing that they want is to be able to make their own decision and be responsible for their own life because they'd rather have mommy or daddy in the form of government or local government or whatever to tell them what to do. And if they don't, they'll be lost. That's what it seems like around here. Well, the proof is in the burning cities, my friend. You know, those, yeah. those are the ones who grow up with the self-hate because everything they put their hope into, government, corporations, has failed to take care of them. So they're easy, they're, they're basically fodder for the new world order. Mm. You know, like Kissinger said, soldiers are just fodder to be used for a political end. That's what these people are, and they don't even know it. They're being psychologically manipulated. They're being uh, set off to march and burn and pillage and loot and destroy. All for what? To, to bring in and usher in this new world order, which has been long in the planning. You know, nobody can deny it now. You know, you look at the UN, even grandma on the back 40, she's going to notice it too. Um, when, when Trump came on and the media began to attack, you know, the media is one of the most powerful forces on the planet. And for a long time, like I said, they were behind the curve and now they're back out ahead of it because of the COVID thing. Yeah. And you're going to see a lot of striking parallels with COVID and the, uh, cultural revolution by Mao. Um, very similar things are happening and it's almost as if they're following that blueprint because as one of the last communistic pushes, that was one of the greatest and quickest transitions in society in the history of the world. I mean, you, they literally had 50 million people dead in a period of 10 years mm -hmm. and completely and utterly transformed rural uh, countrysides into uh, communist uh, regimes that were you know, forced to produce food for next to nothing for the cities. So it's a complete restructuring of society and it's not going to end well, you know, and if they keep pushing the way they're going. And again, the people doing the pushing probably don't even live in this country. So they've got a lot of useful dupes, a lot of useful pawns who they're setting out, you know, like robots to take orders and, and, and uh, using guilt, shame and other things to try to bring other people under their wing in, in, in shows of support. They use their media. They even use NASCAR for the love of God. Oh, you know, Bubba. Yeah, yeah. Good Bubba's grief. noose, right? Uh. Rod's pull down loop, right? <laughs> if that don't say it all, I mean, and, and yeah. probably half the people that saw that story still believe it was a real noose. But anyways, you know, you just, some things, as, as has been said, you can't fix stupid, you mm -hmm. know. It, but people who get away from that and realize the sham for what it is do have a chance, you know, and I'm hoping that at least you can't, you can't unradicalize somebody that has to follow itself to its end. But the only good thing I can say about that is that end is always self-destruction too. It may, you know, because only a self that's destroyed can destroy things outside of itself. I mean, I'm not talking about tearing down an old house that you're going to replace with a beautiful new chapel. I'm talking about tearing down something because you're already tearing down, torn down in yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Only a self-destroyed human being could project destruction on the external world or want it or desire it. You know, those who are constructed humans don't seek destruction as an end. They seek to further construction. Again, that's the life half of the wave. They want to inhale, they want to build, mm. to compress their ideas and make, you know, freeze their thoughts into form and create beauty. That's what the artist does. And I think we've had so many years of decadent art, garbage music, oh, yeah. and all kinds of other things that have basically, it helps to erase the light of the soul of man, you know, and, and I hope that we can uh, hold our own and, and, and continue to meet the light, the, that darkness with our own light, you know, and I think that's, that's how we, at least in my opinion, part of how we help to defeat the scourge. Mm. What do you think of the Q phenomenon? Because it's, it's getting a bit of traction over here, but I take it everything like that. Anything that becomes a collective movement, I take it with a pinch of salt. And so it's getting a bit of traction over here now. Is it quite big over there? You know, I, I, I have friends here and there that, that send me stuff and 
you know, I, whatever they need, it's again, it's, I'm not a big fan of it. I, I've looked at a few things objectively, but you know, I kind of agree with you on that, that it's sort of a take our mind off, you know, what we can do and just yeah, hope yeah. again that some external savior, John F. Kennedy, what didn't really die in a plane crash and he's going to come out and publicly speak about how he was alive. And yeah, it's all well and fine. You know, I, I, I like to dream, you know, but ultimately I, I don't let it take away from what you can do personally to help the moment because we need each and every human being to take part in our own um, future. Mm -hmm. and, and it is a collective future, you know, individuals who want a future collectively create a society or a civilization that want a future. Mm -hmm. And those are made up of heroic types that have, you know, that's, some would say that's where civilization comes from. As Michael Tessarian has done great work on, on showing that, that the heroic type is the reason for civilization. So the anti-hero wishes to tear it down while the hero builds it up. And I think when you have an external hero, like a Q or George Soros or a, or a movement or, or an Antifa or a, you know, this or that, or you know, media matters, blah, blah, blah. You know, your heroes, if they're external, you're already on the down, you're, you're heading toward the death half of the wave right there. Hero, heroes need to be an internal process. They need to be an internal goal. And you must be your hero, and and you must assist in the, uh, in the in the preservation of civilization, because that's the only thing that's going to stop the downward turn, mm -hmm. is to focus toward life, and life is an internal thing first, and then you give it out. So, I would say put the external heroes to the side. Yeah, it'd be great if Q came around. You know, I'd love I'd love nothing more than if. It, all the stuff that was promised, you know, but again, I had a friend back in 2016, he said, next month, you're going to hear handcuffs, you're going to see people getting arrested. A month goes by, I'm like, well, where is it? He goes, oh, it's delayed eight weeks, it's going to be eight weeks, they're going to come out, they're going to arrest all these people. Eight weeks go by, I'm like, where is it, bro? Yeah. Where's the sound of handcuffs? And uh, yeah. nothing. So he said, well, just give it another month, we'll, we'll hear, they're going to make big arrests in a month. And month goes by it's now it's like five months gone by and still no handcuffs and then i'm just like you know i'm glad i never got into to listening to that but mm -hmm. again if it you know fairy tales are fairy tales but if it happens great but in the meantime the real things we can do is not focus on an external savior but find a way to get yourself charged and, and work to build a life-giving environment around your own home start with yourself and then start with your home you got a dirty old closet, clean it out. Yeah. You know, start cleaning up. You got a leaky faucet. You know, there's something to be said about leaks in your house that it actually some part of you is leaking. So when you fix things around your own home and get your own house in balance and in fine working condition, it's as if you're working on your own self because that's your immediate surroundings. You can tell a lot about a person by their immediate surroundings. Is it a, is it a, a complete utter mess? Are there half full glasses of lemonade from three weeks ago that have mold growing in it, yeah. you know, clean up your own house. And, and then you can extend that balance to the neighborhood. You can't tackle it. Otherwise, I think it, again, that's a good lesson, but uh, I'm probably going on a bit. No, that's that, but... that was beautifully put. Uh, Jordan Peterson says something similar. He said, don't try and fix the world before you've you know, made your own bed. Yeah, exactly. You know, that's been said for, you know, for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So, COVID-19, before we wrap it up, do you think it's a complete psyop or do you think there's been like a, a leak of uh, a virus or, or do you think it's just a complete hoax? Well, I think there was definitely a, some kind of flu, uh, cold virus released. I think it was a purposeful man-made because something definitely swept through just my little town Right. I saw people, you know, and it was in December, January, February. Um, and it, it just, it tore through here. It was a hyper flu. I'd call it a hyper flu. And uh, so there, there, you know, it actually made sense when I began to read things like, you know, several so-called authorities said that this was actually released back in October. So it, that, that kind of coincided with that. It, there was something going on that uh, came through 
And uh, uh, no, I don't think it was a, a, a fake virus, but I think what, what is fake are all the, the draconian measures that they're forcing people are trying to force people to, to, to take on like the, the wearing of masks yeah. and uh, things like that. I think that's psychological. In fact, I know it's psychological. I don't have to guess, but ultimately, you know, this is the, uh, again, it's, it's like pushing the death half of the wave, pushing us all to follow in our own destruction. We're not concentrating on life, on the breathing in of fresh oxygen. They have us breathing in our own dead breath, and that is all part and parcel to the push to destroy the only thing that stands between us and world government run by the UN and the, the psych, psychopathic characters like Bill Gates and Fauci and, and others who, who make up their ilk, you know, and the, the bankers, the warmongers, the, the energy barons, and so on. You know, you could, you could lump them all in, the small group of them, but they ultimately want to transform society. And, and they know that, that focusing on death is the way to do it, to bring down and destroy. So basically all our arts have become decadent. All of our music is more or less decadent, unless you make your own, you know, to add to the life-giving half. So there's a big focus on death. You know, Hollywood is an industry of death. Superheroes, like I said years ago, why are the superheroes all becoming dark, like almost villainous? How come they're not full of light anymore? So that, that I noticed that years ago. And uh, anyways, the point of it is that uh, ultimately COVID was basically a continuation of a sort of communism that is soft, but not really questioned by the masses because of the medical side of it. You know, there is such a thing as medical tyranny. And I think they chose this path because it was the path of least resistance. If people fear for their lives, they're more inclined to do whatever an authority will tell them, as opposed to just being ordered when there's no fear for your life. You know, if they'd have come out and there was, there was no cold, no, no corona or any of that, and just said, like they did in China, we want you all to start wearing masks from now on. You know, people would have been like, what are you talking about? No, we're not going to wear masks. But when the fear of your own life is woven into that narrative, then people will pretty much do anything. I mean, if they would have said, go dig a hole in your backyard and cover yourself up with dirt until we tell you to come out, probably one out of a thousand people would have actually done that. Mm. You know, that would be your hardcore CNN watcher, <laughs> you know, but... I don't put it past this human race that actually there would have been people that would have done that because they don't think for themselves. And ultimately that's really the, the most dangerous thing is that people allow these authorities to mandate, not law. This is not law that you have to wear a mask. It is a mandate by an unelected bureaucrat who was, didn't run for office. He, he you know, these people are medical tyrants. And that needs to be seen for what it is, because ultimately, if we're ever going to have freedom, we need to question, you know, what is it we're following? Is this a law or is it a mandate? Is it a proclamation, an edict, or is it actual law that's been debated in our House of Representatives as, at a state level or at the federal level? And ultimately, that's, that's because people don't know their constitutional rights. So I think for myself, I'm looking at possibly doing some work from a constitutional level. I'd love to find a constitutional scholar who, who will uh, meet with me in person and actually film some, some uh, film a, a series on the constitution. I think that would be a really great thing, mm -hmm. uh, especially for the people of the United States, because ultimately we're one of the, the leading countries in the world where if this country falls into a total tyranny, then more than likely the rest of the world's gonna follow suit yeah, because this this is the peak of Western civilization. It's not perfect. Never was. Wasn't built to be perfect. It was the best attempt at employing the knowledge and the truth and the wisdom mm. that humanity had come to, you know, utilize at that time. And you know, it's also the first civilization in the world to make slavery illegal. And so that's there's so many positives, and you're seeing this. You know, people who oppose slavery, their statues being torn down. So the mob has no discernment. They'll tear anything down. 
it was a statue of Pinocchio or a statue of uh, Barney the dinosaur, they tear it down simply because it's a statue. You know, they, they don't discriminate. Statue, bad, right? It's like Orange Man bad. It's all bad. <laughs> so ultimately, where's the good? You know, the good lies in the hearts of people that embrace life, embrace the life after the wave, and want to construct and build and add to society. Uh, we can critique it all we want, but we don't have to burn it down in order to critique it. And that's why this movement is a failed movement. And it's only going to result in one thing, fire. Destruction. Yep. Um, let's start to wrap it up. I've really, really enjoyed talking to you. I could speak about this for like hours or this type of stuff. Um, what, what can people do as an individual um, to create a better life for themselves and their, their, their close families, do you think, right now, practically? I would say find a vocation, find something that interests you, um, deeply love your family, care for your family, do your best, always you know, love the people you're with that are in your life, give the best parts of yourself to your friends and family, be careful of giving to those who don't really <laughs> deserve your help, there's such a thing as giving too much, so again, keep yourself balanced in your givings and re-givings. Um, and always just, uh, I think, try to find in your heart what it is that, that you love and do that thing. Uh, it could be anything, writing poetry, uh, repairing motors, building, you know, with wood, woodworking, anything that, that you love to do, find a way to connect with that because that's a really, I'd say, one of the most rewarding things you can do. For me, it's been gardening. This, this past few months has been gardening. Uh, I'm now a chicken farmer, so, you know, I never thought chickens would be so enjoyable to raise, but just half the fun is watching them. They're, they're these little characters, you know, and um, it's it's an amazing thing, but anything you put your heart to that, that brings you joy, it, it could be, there, there's a million different vocations that one could put and and absorb themselves into, but those things where you work with your hands, you know, put the smartphone down. Yeah. Put it down and find something you can physically do with your own two strong arms and do it because those are the things that are going to stand before you. You can make stuff on a, on a cell phone. You, you can make videos. Podcasts are great. Podcasts are another art form because it's a body of work. This body will go up on the internet along with many of the other things you've done. I've watched a few and I like a lot of your posts. Great stuff. Um, Thank you. So that you're putting something you love out into the world on a digital platform, but I would say also too, that balance that with the, the real world platform. You know, what is, what is it you can make with your own two hands that you can look at that stands before you and, and you can be proud of that to, to say to yourself that I made that. So that's an important thing, you know, just finding something artistic outlet, um, being a good dad, if you've got kids, you know, don't be a mediocre dad, be the best dad you can be, you know, do the best you can, uh, be the best lover, be, be true, find the virtuous uh, attributes and, and practice those. And, uh, you know, as the, the Nazarene would have said, go and sin no more. I think that's really basically like Dr. Russell would say, live the law of balance because to the degree that you break it is to the degree you will be broken by it. Beautiful. Matt, thanks a lot for coming on. I've really enjoyed that. Yeah, Alex, thanks a lot for having me. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much. All the best. Okay. Bye-bye. Cheers.